today we're going to talk about the spirit of Jezebel, and I'd like to send this out to all the ladies, right, because they're usually the ones who get accused of having a spirit of Jezebel. It is one of those things that um, they're often accused of. And every once in a while, not as often, but you will hear that some men have a spirit of Jezebel. Um, and we'll talk about that as well, but we'll take a kind of a look at this. I wanted to start with this. Took this off of the uh, news site uh, from the internet here. It says, southern, some Southern Baptist pastors are calling uh, Kamala Harris Jezebel. What do they mean? Southern Baptist pastors are sharply critical of Vice President Kamala Harris, so some are taking their insults to biblical proportions. And apparently the writer of this article, thinking they're, that they're taking it to biblical proportions, has misunderstood exactly what's being said. Now generally, it's strong, independent women who are labeled as Jezebels, that they're being divisive somehow because instead of bringing themselves under the headship of a male leader or under a, uh, the umbrella of some man's authority, they're sort of usurping that and causing division by doing that. And that's normally what a lot of people think about when they think about Jezebel, but that's not what's happening here. I need to point this out. Back in the Civil War, when male slave owners would rape female slaves, they would excuse their behavior by referring to the female slave as a Jezebel, that, well, she seduced me, that's why it happened. In other words, it was victim blaming. And then later, their wives, the southern ladies, would oftentimes refer to female slaves as Jezebels to excuse away their husband's behavior when they had sex with them. And over time, in the South during the Civil War and the post-war era, the term Jezebel as applied to a female person of color, a black woman, was a racial slur. It is an offensive racial slur to use this. And these Southern Baptist pastors are not being, quote, biblical in proportion. They're hurling a racial slur that their audience understands against a person of color. And they should be called out for it and they should be held accountable for it. Any pastor who stands behind a pulpit and is sending out racial slurs towards anyone, especially for the purpose they're doing it here, for a political purpose, should probably be removed from the pulpit. They are definitely not representing Christianity, the church, or Jesus Christ. So, the spirit of Jezebel is usually hurled as a false accusation against a female. Here's an example. I took this off the internet. I got this from Reddit. Somebody posting their story about being labeled a Jezebel. This is what it says. I am an evangelical Christian who really can't attend church in my area because I've been labeled with this very spirit. One church had some leaders who I caught lying and they were seen as prophets and making false prophetic claims. When I challenged that, it turned out that the pastor was best friends with them and even acknowledged at least one of the leaders was insecure and had a need to appear more spiritual than others to explain the lying. I then was labeled a gossip because I had spoken about the lies in a prayer group, though I didn't name anyone. Turns out they had also been gossiping about me behind my back, but that's just sharing information. This liar made phone calls to me and made vague threats, not to mention starting, starting to label me with a Jezebel spirit. See, and this is what happens. If you were to criticize or even to ask questions of leadership, if you were to point out that there's something sketchy going on with leadership, they will oftentimes label you as having a Jezebel spirit. 
because it's a way to control congregants, especially female congregants, and to keep them, quote, in their place. If you go out to the internet, if you hit Google, I just thought that was kind of interesting. I typed in Jezebel's spirit, right? And it came back with over 3 million websites. And of course, I didn't go to all 3,140,000 of them. But I went through a good number of them, and they pretty much were all the same thing. You don't really have good teaching on the Jezebel spirit. What you get are just sort of cut and paste jobs over and over again of the same pieces of information, right? And so that kind of makes it a little bit easier to trace it all back to its source. Where does it come from? Many of the websites merely try to explain how to identify a Jezebel spirit. Here's the characteristics of somebody who has a Jezebel spirit. Here's how you diagnose a Jezebel spirit. And then, of course, what you need to do about it. And of course, the thing that they always say that you need to do about it is you need to kick these people out of your church. So once again, I'd like to say this is dedicated to all you lovely ladies, especially those who have been labeled Jezebel. You're more than welcome here. Are these actual spirits? Because that's kind of the idea, right? And normally, you would think that when you're talking about these kind of things, it would be kind of confined to charismatic, neo-charismatic circles. But it's not. It's becoming more and more widespread. So are these actual spirits, are these actual demonic spirits that are inhabiting a human being and causing them to behave in this way? Well, that gets kind of tricky. Because when you get to the word that gets translated out as spirit, it's Rauk in Hebrew and Numina in Greek. They don't always mean spirit. They mean different things. It could mean wind. It could mean breath. It could mean spirit. It could mean actually God's creative power. It can also mean your soul, your mood, your emotional state, or a disposition, like a personality disposition. So when you start translating this stuff, you've got to be really careful, and believe me, mistranslations creep in. And so oftentimes these words, which could mean any of these various different things, just gets translated out of spirit. That's the most common way to translate it. And then if you begin to think of this as an evil spirit, when it's more like a personality, then you have a problem. Now you're accusing people of being filled with demons when they're just jerks. Are there, are there spirits? Well, here's kind of some examples. We can take them from the Old Testament, Exodus 28.3. A spirit of skill. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill, and he's going to gather them together, and he's going to build the tabernacle. Is that an actual spirit? Is that like, like an angel that inhabits them or a demon that inhabits them, that they now have a spirit of skill? Or is that merely a disposition? So you have to be careful how you work with these. A spirit of jealousy. And if the spirit of jealousy comes over him and he is jealous of his wife, this comes from Numbers 5.14, okay, this tells you how to deal with jealousy amongst husbands and wives. Is this an evil spirit? Or is this, um, or is this just the mood that they're in at the moment? See what I'm saying? You've got to be careful. Now, in some Neo-charismatic movements, they say there is an evil spirit of jealousy that will come and fill you up and will control you and seeking to destroy you, but perhaps it's just the mood that you're in at the moment. How about a spirit of wisdom? Joshua, the son of Nun, was, filled, uh, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Does that mean the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom? Or is this just a characteristic of that person? that he was a very wise person. The spirit of another person. Now when I saw the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho, saw him oppose opposite them, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. In other words, it could mean he's just similar to another person. That Elisha was very similar to Elijah. Not only in the spelling and pronunciation of their names, but apparently in the way that they acted as well. So it could just be that they're like another person. A spirit of confusion. 
The Lord has mingled within her a spirit of confusion. That's from Isaiah. Is that an evil spirit? Is that a personality disorder? Could that actually be a mental disorder? What is this? See, again, I'm just trying to emphasize we need to be very careful. And just because the Bible is translated into English using the word spirit from its Hebrew or Greek doesn't necessarily mean that's a demon. And so to be casting this around just sort of willy-nilly, irresponsibly, and labeling people with all these spirits, I believe is dangerous and wrong. A spirit of slavery, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Again, this seems to be more of an attitude or personality disposition. A spirit of love and gentleness. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with a love and a spirit of gentleness? Do some people have a spirit of gentleness? Is that some, would that be a demonic being that, that takes control of an individual and makes them really gentle? No, I mean, this is more of an attitude, right? It's more of a mood. It's more of a disposition. A spirit of antichrist. Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the antichrist. It's kind of a defining characteristic of who this person is. Not necessarily an actual demonic spirit. A spirit of what, necessarily? See, it does not necessarily mean a demon. So what is a spirit of Jezebel? And if you're hanging around again in charismatic, neo-charismatic circles, they're going to tell you it's an actual demon. Let me give an example of some bad theology here. Took this off of the website, devotional.net. I didn't find it very <sighs> devoting me to God at this particular point. But it's some thoughts on the Jezebel spirit and the Absalom spirit in the local church. If you're wondering what an Absalom spirit is, that's a way to make a male equivalent of the Jezebel spirit. Some people call it the Ahab spirit. So, you know, for men, you know, we call them Absalons or we call them Ahabs. Uh, every once in a while, we call them a Jezebel. And sort of the equivalent of what that means is, well, you're just sort of a beta male. You're a cuckold, you're a cuck right? You're less than a man because you're letting women walk all over the top of you. Uh, this was uh, Dr. Dan uh, Cheatham, okay? It says, recall or reread the story of Elijah and Jezebel in 1 Kings chapter 16 through 2 Kings chapter 9. Now, in that particular passage of scripture, it talks about the really bad King Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who led the children of Israel astray into idolatry. And she was um, considered sort of a sexually provocative woman. I mean, it does actually say in the Bible she put on makeup. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. What it says here is there can be no detente with Jezebel. Jezebel has to be dealt with. Jezebel does not have it within her to change. Jezebel will strike again, and Jezebel must be run off. And that's pretty serious. If you label somebody like this, it's like they need to be thrown out of the church. But here's what he says. Jezebel is not just a principality or power. It is a stronghold of the second highest classification of demons listed in Ephesians chapter 6. It is a ruler of the darkness of this world, Hold up in a strong and unbroken woman. Does he give any evidence that they're actually that this is an actual spirit or an actual stronghold? Does he give any evidence? No. He just makes the assertion. And of course, where is it at? In a strong and unbroken woman. Because we all know all the women need to be broken, like a horse. Right? We can't have strong, independent women. That's a no-no, not in our church. You sit there, you know, in your skirt, not wearing your makeup, being submissive to your husband. If you're not, you Jezebel. So bad theology, where did this all come from? Oh, Lord. Well, 
In the Old Testament, oftentimes, Jezebel was a symbol of Canaanite religion and pagans. She led the children of Egypt, I mean, sorry, she led the children of Israel into idolatry. And she led them to worship the Canaanite Baal. And so she became symbolic of a false prophetess who leads people into the Canaanite religion. In the Middle Ages, the term was used to disparage powerful female leaders. So if you go through the, if you go through the Middle Ages and you look at a world map and you pick out all the monarchs, you look at all the kings and queens, you'll find a whole bunch of queens during the Middle Ages who are labeled as Jezebels because they're leading and ruling, which is definitely a no-no for a female. In the holiness movement of the 19th century, and again, this is mostly sort of uh, precursor to the, to the Pentecostals and Charismatics. In the holiness movement of the 19th century, it was, it was used to describe women who wore makeup. Because just before Jezebel dies, she puts on makeup. And then she falls from her balcony and is eaten by dogs. But women who wore, wear makeup, whoa, you Jezebels. It eventually became a term to describe prostitutes because prostitutes were known to wear makeup. Hmm. But here it is. Here's where the really bad theology comes in. Here's where we kind of get the idea of the Jezebel spirit. In 1994, Francis uh, Frangipane wrote a book called The Battleground of the Mind. And he, and he had three battlegrounds that he was looking at. Number one, I'm sorry, they called the three battlegrounds. He had three that he was looking at. The mind, the church, and the heavenly places. He said, you know, we battle Satan on three fronts. In the mind, in the church, and in the heavenly places. And, all the, and the last couple of chapters about the heavenly places are all about the Jezebel spirit. That there's this spirit that comes into the church and it gets into the women. And it gets into the women, and it, and it turns them rebellious. Right? Looks like we flipped through some slides there when I wasn't looking. Turns the women rebellious, and they attack the leaders of the church. They, they attack the uh, pastors of the church. And so what happens is these women get blamed for all of this as having some kind of demonic spirit. Oh, there we go. Now we're getting closer to where we're supposed to be. There we are. So he spends the last part of his book discussing this third battleground of the Jezebel spirit coming in and affecting the, the women of the church so they attack male leadership within the church. So after he wrote this, somebody decided to write some more. I mean, if it's a bestseller, let's make some money, right? So they had unmasking the Jezebel spirit. This was 2016, John Paul Jackson. It's actually 12 chapters 12 chapters long, and it's all stories, anecdotal stories, about battling the Jezebel spirit. So it's a whole bunch of guys writing about, oh, I had this woman in my church, and what a pain in the neck she was. And this is what I had to do to get rid of her. 12 chapters of this. And of course, I, I need to point this out to you. Christians, we need to be a little more discerning about the stuff we buy and the stuff that we read. Now, yes, these books come from a, quote, Christian publishing house. But you know what? All those Christian publishing houses and all those record companies that, you know, music companies that turn out Christian music, they're owned by secular companies. They're not run by actual Christians. So a lot of these books, they get published because... They make money. And if you get a book like this that makes money, guess what? You're going to get lots of other books that say exactly the same thing because that's what people want to hear and it makes a profit for the company. There's no, there's no group of theologians or pastors or anybody sitting around going, this is good theology. There's a board of directors who are like, this book sells, get me four more just like it. And so we end up with all these other ones. The Jezebel spirit defeating Jezebel. The Ahab and Jezebel spirit confronting Jezebel. Jezebel's puppets. And these are just a few. 
There's probably 50 or 60 books with titles similar to this. And so once this gets cranking out and going, right, it's almost like not quite as much as like a viral TikTok video, but it's like going viral. More and more books about it. Now everybody's talking about it. Now we're making websites about it. Now we're preaching sermons about it. And this bad theology infects the church this way because some secular publishing company finds out it makes money. Let's do an example of good theology. This comes from the book of Revelation, and this is often the verse that is quoted to support a Jezebel spirit, but of course it's misquoted. So let's put it back into the context that it needs to be put into the context that it needs to be. And to, the ch- and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these are the words of the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your work, your love, faith, service, and endurance. I know that your latest works are greater than your first, but I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet and is teaching and beguiling my servants to engage in sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. (gasps) There's a Jezebel spirit right there. See, they had it. There was some demon that came into the church at Thyatira and it infested this woman and, and she did all these horrible things and she's splitting up the church. And No, 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 no. What this was, very specifically, was in the church of Thyatira. There was a woman who was proclaiming herself a prophet. And she was leading people into idolatry and sexual immorality. And that's why she got labeled symbolically as a Jezebel. Because like the Jezebel of the Old Testament, she led the children of Israel into idolatry to worship the Baals. And oftentimes in Canaanite religions where you worship Baal, there's sexual acts that go with that. And you notice that in this text, it talks about food, eating food sacrificed to idols. And we here in the 21st century are like, what's the big deal? What's this all about food sacrificed to idols? What's going on? But the thing about eating food sacrificed to idols is not only could you buy it in the marketplace, but oftentimes you would be invited to a dinner being hosted by a patron inside the temple where the food was being served. And by participating in that meal, you were worshiping the God that the food was offered to. And yes, sometimes it was food and an orgy afterwards. So here you are with whoever your patron is and he's invited you to this big party and she's saying well that's okay there's no big deal it's all right go ahead and do that because they were struggling in these seven churches of asia minor with conforming to the religions of the roman empire and this would have been normal behavior and she's saying well it's okay gnosticism which says hey don't worry what your body does you just have to worry about your spirit the body doesn't count So do whatever you want, eat, drink, and be merry, have all the sex you want, no big deal. That was creeping into the church, and she most likely was teaching that. And so, yes, she's labeled as a Jezebel. That would be good theology, that she's like the Jezebel of the Old Testament. She has a spirit of Jezebel in the fact that she is like Jezebel. Do you see a strong and broken woman here? (laughs) No. No. Do you see somebody who's independent and thinking for themselves? No. Do you see somebody who's necessarily critical of leadership? No. We just know that like the previous Jezebel, she was proclaiming herself a prophet and leading the people into sexual immorality and idolatry. In this example, Jezebel is used symbolically, a false prophetess leading a group into sexual immorality and idolatry, and she's being compared to the Old Testament Jezebel. That's good theology. That's okay. The Old Testament Jezebel led the Israelites away from Yahweh to worship Baal. The false prophetess can be said to have a spirit of Jezebel in that she is similar to the first Jezebel. That's not a problem. But that's not how it's being used today. See, how it's being used today is as a tool in the hands of patriarchy to oppress women and to make them second-class citizens within the church. 
Time Magazine printed an article of how female monarchs were, were portrayed as Jezebels. I referred to this before. If you go through the Middle Ages, you see a lot of the female monarchs were labeled as Jezebels. And if you want to, you can take a look at that uh, link there. You can go read it for yourself. It was a hand in the tool of the patriarchy to keep female monarchs in their place and keep them under control, not to show too much independence. Here's a few descriptions of a Jezebel spirit from the book, What Are the Characteristics of a Jezebel Spirit by S. Don Swaby. And when you hear these, I'm going to ask you a question. Is this a Jezebel spirit, a demonic spirit? Or is this somebody who's been victimized just trying to find safe place, safe space? Refusal to admit guilt or wrong. Does that indicate a Jezebel spirit that they refuse to admit guilt or wrong? What if they are not guilty? What if they are not wrong? What if they have criticized a leader? What if they disagree with a pastor or a prophet or a teacher? Or they say, you know, that was a false prophecy. You said this would come to pass and yet it did not come to pass. You're wrong. You're criticizing me. You're attacking leadership. You're a Jezebel. It's just victim blaming. Refuses to admit guilt or wrong. What if they're not guilty? What if they're not wrong? Why would they admit it? See, that's not a very good description, if you ask me. See, this just allows control by refusing to allow questions, criticism, or critique. You run into a pastor that does not allow questions, criticism, or critique, you need to flee from that pastor. I have, I have received some of the best stuff here at Old Open Door. You know, I remember when I, when I did my sort of Politics in the Cross series. You know, one of the ladies of the church came up to me and said, you know, I want to talk to you about this. I think you went too far in this one area. And I was able to hear that. I'm able to go, yeah, you know, I need to rethink that. Your pastor should be capable of growth. Your pastor should be capable of change. See, the problem is, that we're like, pastors stand up here and go, this is what God said. God can't change. Uh, there's a whole lot of pastors who are standing behind the pulpit preaching what they think, not necessarily what God says. That's why I try to be honest with you about this is my spiritual journey I'm sharing with you. So I'm probably going to change and grow at different times. And yes, I welcome the feedback. I welcome the criticism. I welcome the critique. As long as it's all legit. You know, if you just hurl, oh, you know, you have an Ahab spirit, I'm probably going to blow you off. You have the spirit of Absalom within you, you heretic blasphemer. I'll just be like, eh, you know, not buying it. Ah, how about this one? Ignores people. The spirit of Jezebel ignores people. How do we know that's just not a, a woman who's being abused setting a few boundaries? and refusing to engage with her abuser, right? Setting a boundary not to engage with the abuser is characterized as ignoring or unforgiving. Sounds like the abuser is manipulating. Well, he says you're ignoring him. I can't go anywhere near him because he attacks me every time. Sounds more like a woman just looking for safe space is insubordinate. Oh, insubordinate? Hmm. Insubordination, or are they just a threat to the leader's unquestioned power and authority? There are some pastors, you question their power or authority, you insubordinate Jezebel. You have some kind of demonic spirit in you that you would question me, the man that God has chosen to lead this church. Thou shalt not touch my servant, declares the Lord. Really? Can I, can I just be honest with you? Pastors are not perfect. They make mistakes all the time. They have issues too, because they're human beings. 
pastor is not some supernatural state of being. Pastor is just a function within the church. It's one part of the body and it needs the rest of the body to keep it within its boundaries. Ah, a Jezebel woman is independent. Independent? Oh, God forbid. We like, you know, our women broken like horses and nice and, you know, subservient. What is wrong with you independent women? Is this just pushback against control and manipulation of an abusive leader? How dare you think for yourself? How dare you think for yourself? I can't believe you would question the male leadership around here. <sighs> Jezebel. You have a Jezebel spirit. So having heard all this, <sighs> this nonsense of a Jezebel spirit, how do we respond to it? What should we do? Well, first off, I think those Southern Baptist pastors need to be kicked out of their pulpits for hurling racial slurs, and they know they're racial slurs, and they're doing it for only one reason, and it's political. It's disgusting. We should just kick them right out of the pulpit. You know, the Southern Baptist Convention is having its issues right now with all the cover-up of sexual abuse and various other abuses, and a lot of them around women. Maybe it's time to chop that disease tree down. But how do we live this out? Well, the term Jezebel should only be used for a false prophetess. So if you come to me, ladies, and you claim to be a prophet, I'll be keeping my eye on you as I would anybody who claimed to have the gift of prophecy, male or female. People who claim to have the gift of prophecy, that's one of those things I'm like going, let's see if what you're saying aligns with Scripture, because if it doesn't, that's false prophecy, male or female. But this should only be used against a false prophetess who is leading people into idolatry. So if you come into my church and you say, you know, God told me that it's perfectly okay that we establish an altar of Zeus right here in our church and that we can worship Zeus, I'm definitely going to question you. I'm going to be like, Zeus, let's worship Bacchanal. You know, let's, let's worship Bacchus. He's a lot more fun. Zeus, he's no fun. If, you're gonna, if we're going to do idolatry, let's at least do it right. Let's worship Bacchus, right? God of wine and party. Woo. That way we can work in the sexual immorality. This is only a very specific situation where somebody is like or has the spirit of Jezebel. And so it should not just be bantied about and thrown around as a label all over the place. It is a serious accusation for a very specific situation. Beware of male leaders, let me say this again, beware of male leaders who throw this term around and use it as a way to control women. Why do you need to control them? What are you afraid of? Sounds like you're a little insecure. Sounds like you can't be challenged. Sounds like you're not willing to grow and change. There's something wrong here. We need to admit that the patriarchy of the Bible is descriptive of a Bronze and Iron Age culture. It's the context of the Bible, not the command of the Bible. You know, we read into all these Old Testament passages and we take them completely out of context by saying, this is what God commands. No, this is what the context that the Bible was written in and how God responded to it then, congratulations, we're in the 21st century. No, 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 no. God's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He never changes. You've never read your Bible? Changes all the time. Big change between Old Testament and New Testament. There are verses in the Bible where God says, you know, I had a change of heart. I repented of what I was going to do. We have to update biblical principles for the 21st century. That's what Jesus did. Oh, yeah, they crucified him for that. Forgot about that part. 
Educated, assertive, and influential women are not Jezebels. They are just threats to abusive male leaders. I love me a nice, educated, assertive, and influential woman. I like hanging out with those people. I find them intellectually stimulating. I'm like, yeah. I know quite a few of them. Those are the ones I want to hang out with. The New Testament lists women in leadership roles such as deacon, apostles, patrons, and prophets. Multiple deacons, apostles, patrons, and prophets are women. And do you know that as you go through the Old Testament, only one woman who is unnamed is an example of a Jezebel? When you look at the evidence of the Old Testament, having educated, influential, assertive women was normal. And they became deacons and apostles and patrons and prophets. And they were praised for it. And only one, one, was labeled a Jezebel. And yet, that seems to be the only one we can see. That's the one they all focus on. That's the one they all weaponize to hurt people. The church needs to stop labeling people. Here's where I get to go off on a rant. The church has a tendency to label people. You know, you get all kinds of labels out there. Well, they're just name-only Christians. They're not a real Christian. They're just a name-only Christian. They're a Jezebel or an Ahab or an Absalom. They're just disgruntled. They're just country club Christians. They don't take Christianity serious. They're just troublemakers. And why do we stick these labels on people? We usually stick these labels on people who are criticizing leadership or have chosen to leave the church for some reason because it allows us just to label them and to avoid dealing with the issues in the local body. Rather than saying, you know, <laughs> there's something wrong here, something going on, our church culture is driving people away, they just label them. Well, they're just name-only Christians. Uh, their opinion doesn't count. They're just country club Christians. They're whatever Christian. We just throw a label on them, and then we don't have to deal with what's happening in the local body. We don't have to deal with the culture that we've created. And we need to start dealing with the culture that we create rather than just labeling people. All right. If you found this content helpful, please like this video and share your comments with us below. I'd like to hear from you. How many of you have been labeled with a Jezebel spirit? How many of you have heard this or know somebody who's a Jezebel? I know at least a dozen. I kind of like them. That's going to get me labeled a blasphemer and a heretic. Oh. But share your comments with us below. It helps our community as well as our YouTube channel. So we thank you for that. Let's uh, close out in prayer. Join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just pray that the church, especially the American church, which has created such a toxic culture, will stop labeling people with these abusive names and terms to simply dismiss them rather than deal with our own issues. Lord, I, I'm thinking about the Southern Baptist Convention and all the women who have been hurt and abused and dismissed. I pray that your Holy Spirit just goes out to them and touches them and heals their, heals their, their wounds, Lord, both physical, psychological, and emotional, all of their wounds, Lord. Father, help us to keep the Bible within context and that as you raise up female leaders, that we don't label them as Jezebel because we see them as a threat. But we praise them as you praise them. We pray this in your name. Amen. By the way, I just want to point out, you know, we need to be careful of those who claim the gift of prophecy within the church. A lot of false prophets out there. I could mention my, fam my favorite pink-haired lady who just... But even I'm not going to label her a Jezebel. You know, she claims to have visions of heaven and you get to go to heaven and ride down lava slides down the side of a 
volcano like an amusement park. <gasps> okay. She's not a Jezebel. She's just because she's not leading you into sexual immorality or the or idolatry. She's leading you into distraction and stupidity. That's a whole different spirit. I don't know what spirit she's like. I don't know what spirit she's been taken to get to that point to be seeing those things. <sighs> Definite false prophet. It's just a distraction to the church. Well, let me close with this benediction before I get too crazy about her. Another of my long list of people who annoy me. As you leave this place, may you please understand that we need to deal with the issues of the church and not merely label other people as troublemakers. Go in peace. God bless you. You are dismissed. We are one in Christ, we are one in God, we are one in unity. We are one in truth, we are one in faith, we are one eternity.